Around 400 years ago, on a small island of Imbonia in present-day Indonesia, 10 Englishmen, around 9 Japanese soldiers and an Indo-Portuguese slave overseer were executed by Dutch East India Company. What crimes did these men commit? When we often read about the big battles and the decisions that changed the direction of the world's history, we often forget that the precursors to these significant events lead no more to one or few individuals. Once a small event that was going to alter Britain's history on a consequential scale was going to be the Ambionia Massacre of 1623. In the 17th century, the islands of Indonesia were among the most important trading hotspots in the world, as nutmegs and cloves, one of the most sought-after spices in Europe, only grew on a very few islands in the archipelago. Before the age of exploration, Europeans would get the supply of these precious spices from the Arab traders, who would charge them premium prices, never revealing to Europeans where these spices actually come from. Then the age of exploration dawned and it was discovered that these spices are cultivated on the very few islands in the East Indies. First Portuguese in the early 1500s, then Dutch in 1596 and afterwards English in 1603 came luring to these islands in the hopes to establish their dominance over the spice trade. All European powers were struggled to monopolize the spice trade, but eventually the Dutch East India Company would come out as a victorious in this race. However, this success wasn't going to arrive effortlessly to the Dutch East India Company. In the early 1600s, when the competition and the hostilities between the European companies were rising, the Dutch company was facing an impending crisis. It did not have the adequate manpower. By 1610, the company was operating around 7 fortresses and 10 vessels in the region, but to guard these possessions, they only had around 5 to 600 soldiers. The voyages from Europe were long, on average it would take around 8 months to reach the archipelago, and on those journeys as well, around 7% of the voyages would end up losing their limbs and the 3% of their lives due to scurvy. To survive in a progressively getting hostile environment, the company had to do something. The solution? The solution to this acute shortage of men had came in the form of Japanese mercenaries, the ruthlessness of the Japanese mercenaries was already known across East Asia. Just in 1603, they had helped in quelling the Chinese revolt in the Philippines on behalf of their Spanish masters, plus Jan Peterson Kuhn, a man whom James I of England would once describe him as a man deserving of hanging. He was only around 20 years old when he first reached on the shores of the East Indies, but his ferocity and the use of violence to achieve his objectives had quickly allowed him to become one of the most critical figures in the Dutch East India Company. Kuhn had envisioned, rather than tediously trying to negotiate with the native populations, their subjugation would be necessary if the Dutch East India Company wanted to succeed in the East Indies, nor he believed that any other European company should have any share whatsoever in the spice trade. For his fellow Protestant allies, Kuhn once wrote, it is incomprehensible that the English should be allowed one-third of the cloves, nutmegs, and maize, for they cannot lay claim to a single grain of sand in the Malacca's Ambionia or Banda. It is obvious, if the Dutch company and later Kuhn wanted to realize their vision, the Japanese mercenaries were the key. The earliest account of Japanese mercenaries entering the Dutch company belongs to January 29, 1613, when one of the company's employees in Japan is writing to his governor general, informing him about the shipment of 68 men out of 300 requested because there was no space left on the ships to put more men. Such was the need of these soldiers that out of the first 68 men, 50 were already deployed on the siege of the Spanish garrison in Tidori Island in July 1613. The operation was a good success for Dutch as they ended up taking the Spanish fort and further increasing their grip over the East Indies. This was not going to be the only success Dutch were going to achieve with Japanese soldiers. Under Kuhn's command, Dutch would further launch the siege of Jakarta in 1619 and the conquest of Banda Island in 1621, and in these campaigns, Japanese soldiers would fight alongside their Dutch counterparts. Kuhn had left the post of Governor General on February 1, 1623. But before leaving, he had strictly instructed his governor squatted in the East Indies to trust English no more than open enemies. In reply to Kuhn's instructions was one governor of the Ambionia region named Herman Wanspold, who faithfully replied to Kuhn, 
we hope to direct things according to your orders that our sovereignty shall not be diminished by English encroachments and if we may hear of any conspiracies we shall do justice to English suitably and hesitatingly and immediately. Von Spuller did not know back then but of all the Dutch governors in the East Indies, he was going to be the one to uncover or perhaps invent a conspiracy implicating his master mortal enemies English. On the night of February 22, 1623, a Japanese soldier by the name of Hatsio was poking his head around the Dutch castle, asking a couple of questions like how many soldiers there were in the castle, how many times they changed the watch every night. Though it is said that he had asked these questions before, what was really unusual about this occasion was that Hatsio was essentially asking these questions to young and inexperienced Dutch soldiers. Perhaps because of his persistence or perhaps for some other reason, Dutch guards decided to inform their superiors about this guard. The next day on February 23, the already suspicious Hunan von Spolt, in order to find out what was really up with this Japanese mercenary, he made Heitzio appear before him and the Dutch council. Upon questioning, Heitzio first denied having made any kind of inquiries, but when the soldiers whom he had been asking the questions were brought before him, he receded from his previous statement and said that he had done it out of merry disposition and for pleasure. But Von Spool reasoned that such things at unreasonable times could not be asked for pleasure but the necessity must be otherwise. Few weeks before Heitzio's interrogation, Dutch had arrested their Indo-Portuguese slave overseer Augustine Pierce. Augustine was only arrested for hurling abuses at the Dutch company's employees. But Dutch reported that Augustine had threatened them that the devil should fetch those who had given him his stick, especially the governor. Though I could be wrong here, Augustine might have been calling English the devil. Dutch often in scorn used to call English the descendant of the devil. And Augustine was after all working with Dutch for how long I cannot say. However, months after the events of Ambionia, once pulled would reveal that he was haunted by nightmares after Augustine's threat and it was the reason why he had decided to question Hatsio in the first place. Back during the interrogation session, when Wonspool could not make Hatsio say that would have affirmed his fears, he made Hatsio to be bound to the door's frame, a cloth was wrapped around his neck and Dutch then started waterboarding him. Dutch tormented Hatsio until he couldn't bear no longer and he desired that they would seize and he would confess. First, Hatsio claimed that there was present a Japanese plot to seize their Dutch castle. But Wonspool could not believe that the Japanese could undertake such a daring feat on their own. After all, who would have dared to attack the castle men with 2 to 300 Dutch troops with only 11 or 12 mercenaries? This is where Wonspool surpassed where even his master Kuhn had failed a year before. It is alleged that under Kuhn's command, Dutch interrogators had unsuccessfully tried to make Bernanese implicate English. When Kuhn had discovered an alleged plot to overthrow his government by native Bernanese in early 1622, Wonspool not only made Hatsio implicate other Japanese African slaves and their slave overseer Augustine Pierce, but also English hand in the conspiracy. As reported by Dutch, Hatsio confessed that he was asked by a certain Japanese translator named Sidney Majel. Sidney had previously worked for the English East India Company, but now he was working with the Dutch company, whether he would lend his aid amongst other Japanese to deliver the castle into the hands of the English. Hatsio then told Dutch that he and various other Japanese had been to the English house in Ambionia to consult more about taking the Dutch castle with an English merchant Timothy Johnson and one English barber surgeon A. Bell Price. According to Hatsio, the alleged plot was going to take place something like this. Inside the Dutch castle, two two Japanese soldiers were going to occupy every corner of the fort and the remaining would have placed themselves in the hall. When any English ship had appeared on the shores of Ambionia, they would have seized the governor and had killed those who had offered them any resistance. Whether Hatsio was further tortured into saying this is not known, Know that all the documents that came out of the Ambionian trial were alleged and could very well have been subject to Dutch forgery to strengthen their case. The next day on February 24, it was the turn of other Japanese soldiers. Sidney Majel, the translator, was brought before the interrogators. After an intense session of waterboarding, Sidney's spirit broke too. Sidney confessed that about two or three months ago, he had met that English barber surgeon Abel Price who had asked him if he knew a way to induce the Japanese to deliver the Dutch castle to English. 
After consultations with Evel, Sydney said that he had then asked the Japanese if they could lend their aid in the said business, to which all of them had agreed on good compensations and shared booty. Sydney then further told Dutch that he had met Gabriel Tawerson, the chief English factor of Ambonia, Von Spolant's equivalent from the English side, uh, one uh, Eminel Thompson, one John Clark, and other Englishmen multiple times to get updates on how the business was proceeding. Once Sydney's interrogation was over, Dutch had interrogated eight other Japanese on that day, and they all had allegedly subscribed to the conspiracy. By now, English in Ambonia had also come to know that the Japanese guards in the Dutch fort were uh, in some kind of trouble. Gabriel Towson ran into Wonspold and told him that he knew their Japanese soldiers were imprisoned, to which Wonspold replied that they were up to no good. In response, Towson affirmed that they should be punished as they deserved. Was Towson deliberately acting ignorant here? Did Towson have some kind of exaggerated trust in Japanese integrity? Or Towson really did not have any idea what was really going on around him. Whatever might have been the case, the night of February 24, 1623 was the last night Towson went to sleep as a free man. It was only around 9 am in the morning, Gabriel Towson and his colleagues were called at the Dutch castle. Leaving only one man at their house, all the summoned men went to the castle. On their arrival, Wonspol told Towson that he and his colleagues were accused of conspiring against Dutch and now they were under arrest. Later, that one person whom English had left at their house was also arrested. After arresting Towson and others, Dutch moved with their interrogations. On February 25, three people were interrogated, one Japanese and two Europeans, Abel Price and Timothy Johnson. Upon bearing severe torture, that Japanese soldiers did confess that he knew there existed a conspiracy, but being old and fickle, he did not present his service. To get Evil Price, Dutch only had to go as far as their prison cell because, like that slave overseer Augustine Pierce, Evil was already locked inside Dutch confinement for drunkenness and threatening to set some men's houses on fire. Abel Price was brought before the interrogators, first the names, dates, and details about the plot were brought before him, then Dutch started torturing him. To hasten the process, Dutch brought Japanese soldiers with their, and I quote, mangled bodies. One can only imagine what those soldiers had to endure to terrorize Abel Price. Perhaps fearing the consequences, Abel confirmed almost everything Sidney had said in his alleged confession a day before. Like he had met Sidney Miguel, but on Captain Towson's command, that they had been to English House in Ambonia multiple times to inform Captain Towson of their discourse. After Abel's confession, Timothy Johnson was brought before the interrogators. When Timothy was being interrogated, one John Beamount, one of the survivors of the Ambonia incident, was standing in the hall. Later, while recalling the moments, John revealed that he heard Timothy cry out very pitifully, then be quiet for a little while, and then loud again. Whereas Timothy's official confession only mentions that he was tortured with fire. When Timothy was brought out of the interrogator's room, John reported that he was all wet and cruelly burnt in various parts of his body. Of all the people, Timothy would most dramatize the plot. In his alleged confession, he would reveal that on New Year's Day, Captain Towson had held a meeting. Yes, Towson did hold a meeting on that day, but if any of the said conversation which Timothy was allegedly about to reveal took place, only God has the answers. Timothy said, on that meeting, Towson laminated how the Hollanders did great injuries to the English and asked if they had not the courage to revenge all their wrongs. For his own part, he knew the ways and means both with and without the aid of certain soldiers that were lodged in the castle to make himself master of the Dutch castle. On day 4, only a Scottish tailor by the name of Robert Brown was interrogated. Robert wasn't formally accused by anyone, but Dutch reported that in December 1622, Robert had threatened them that the English company would soon be stronger and within a year they would rule the Dutch castle. Whether Robert had been bluffing or not, or even had said those words or not, 
Robert Duke was made to confess almost on the same lines. The one new thing that Robert added to the narrative was a Bible. He said on that New Year's Day meeting, Towson had first made them swear on the Bible and then he had put forth his scheme to take the castle. On day 5, not one or two but up to 9 detainees were interrogated. Few were tormented, many is said to have not, except for one John Clark, who was on record tortured with water as well as with fire. John Clark was able to withstand torture for so long that he made his examiners all enraged up and they started calling him a devil or a witch. The narrative in most of the confessions that day was almost the same. The considerable differences in my opinion are the following. Where in Robert Brown's confession, Towerson already had Japanese soldiers at his service. In John Fardo's, Towerson only knew a way to find enough men. In Edward Collins' confession, after the New Year's Day meeting, the alleged conspirators had assembled again, and it was there Towerson had informed them that he had Japanese soldiers at his devotion. However, when William Griggs went ahead of all, he confessed that at the conference, Towson talked about not only having Japanese but also slaves and some Spanish prisoners at his service. Then there were Josh Sherrock and William Weber. On the day of that New Year's Day meeting, they both were not present in Ambionia, yet when brought before the examiners, both ran to fabricate whatever stories they could to save themselves from the torture. Poor Sherrock unsurprisingly got some of the dates mixed up, to which his enraged interrogator chided him that he would be tormented with fire and water to death then should be drawn by the heels to gallows and there hanged up. But Sherrock was eventually saved by several Dutchmen who spoke in his favor. Like Sherrock, William Weber was also not present in Ambionia, but once before the examiners, he too ran to fabricate whatever stories he could to save himself from the torments. Like Sherrock, William too was saved by a Dutch merchant who told the governor that he and William were together making merry on New Year's Day. But before William could be saved, he already had gotten himself into very deep trouble. He told Dutch that John Clark, whom Dutch had been addressing him as a witch, had sent him a letter in which John had indicated him about some great business in hand. Dutch promised William that they would spare his life if he could bring them this letter and hence the interrogations of day 5 were over. On day 6 only two people were interrogated, Samuel Coulson who would allegedly profess his innocence in his psalm book and the alleged mastermind of all this mess Gabriel Towerson. The only mentionable point differed in Coulson's confession was that the time of putting the plot to execution was not yet determined, besides that he allegedly confessed almost on the same lines. Next was the turn of Gabriel Towerson. At the time of his interrogation, Gabriel had become a veteran chief English factor to say the least. He had very likely first arrived in the East Indies all the way back in the early 1600s with the English company's second voyage. One may not know this, but Towson had came to India as well. He actually was the one who had married Sir William Hawkins' widow Mariam Khan. It is highly unlikely that after spending years in the East Indies, Towson had remained unaffected by ever-growing grievances Dutch were causing them. Just after assuming the seat of the chief English factor of Ambionia in September 1622, merely five months before the events, Gabriel wrote to his head counsel in Batavia informing them that there were so many incidents to report from Ambionia alone that he possibly won't be able to write them out in the three pages that were left spare to him. Though Towson seemed to be optimistic about one's world, in the same letter he wrote with his good words and carriage, he wins the native people much more than would have been done with the expense of much more money and infusion of blood. After Towson's succession, Gonspool had also seemed eager to set his relations on the right path with the English by having their own housing in Ambionia. Gonspool might have had good intentions by letting English have their own private dwelling, but without knowing Gonspool himself had set one crucial precondition where a conspiracy could be hatched. If English and Dutch had continued to live in shared dwellings and if Hatsio had apprehended and had wrongly accused English, it is certain that some Dutchmen would have spoken in defense of English like they did in the case of William Weber and George Sherrock. 
Few days after Towson's interrogation, one John Weatherall was brought before the interrogators. When Dutch questioned him about that New Year's Day meeting, John Weatherall could not remember anything besides talking about rotten clothes. But to John and as well as others' bad luck, he did not have any Dutch who could have professed for his innocence. A night before Towson was interrogated, Edward Collins had told Towson the plot's narrative in details if he wanted to save himself from the torture, but once before the examiners, Towson nonetheless sincerely professed his innocence. But to no avail, Towson too was likely waterboarded and later he was made to subscribe to the conspiracy as well. When asked what instigated him to plot a siege on the Dutch castle, Towson is said to have replied for honor and profit. When asked from whom he expected to receive this honor, he said from his headquarters in Batavia. Though Towson told Dutch that no person whatsoever gave him any order or charge of the said business, that he was the topmost mastermind of the Ambionia conspiracy. Also opposed to Abel and Sidney's accusations, Towson allegedly said that he personally did not speak with the Japanese, but he caused them to be treated with by others. From March 1st, 1623 to March 3, the final five accused men were interrogated, of which two persons, John Powell and Thomas Shark, were spared because they had not present in Ambionia for five and six months respectively, but the other three, Augustine Pierce, John Weatherhall, and Eminel Thompson, were severely tortured. Eminel Thompson, like John Clark, was able to endure torments for so long that Dutch started believing he was a witch as well. Years down the lines, Monsfull Stewart had recalled how Thompson and John Clark had some enchanted characters about them, which had moved them to search the bodies of these men very narrowly. But eventually, Thomas, Weatherall, and Pierce were also made to subscribe to the conspiracy, and the interrogations were henceforth over. Monsfull by now had more than 30 men under his confinement. While he was still contemplating how he should proceed, whether he should transfer this case to his head office in Batavia, two ships showed up on the horizon of Ambionia. Oh my god, these plotters had said that they were going to launch the attack when any English ship would show up on the shores of Ambionia, and now they were coming not one but two. To Dutch relief, those two ships were none other than of their own companies. On one of the ships, there was arriving a letter that was going to seal the fate of Towson and others forever. That letter was a reply to Towson's letter that he had sent back in uh, September 1622, that same letter that he had sent after assuming the seat of Chief English Factor of Ammonia. The person replying in this letter was Towson's own president, Richard Fersland. Firstly, to all the praises Towson had sent about Dutch governor, Fursland did not seem he was touched at all. Instead, in this letter, he was warning Towson to not get carried away with Von Swart's guides. We know he is free enough, but in your main affairs, you will find him to be a subtle man. Therefore, be careful you be not circumvented in matters of importance through his disassembling friendship. The warning had arrived too late for Towson because he had already handed his fate in the hands of Ronspold. The next thing that Towson's president was informing him about was even more startling. By 1622, the financial standing of the English East India Company had become so dire that in September 1622, Fursland instructed his chief factor at Ignate to close down four factories in his region. And now in this letter, Fursland was informing Towson to expect some definitive answer from London in deciding the fate of their factories in Ambionia. But from his own part, Fursland was recommending Towson to settle their affairs in Ambionia and be ready to come away. Yes, you heard it right, Fursland was instructing Towson to be ready to disband their factories in Ambionia. When he understood that there was no one coming to assist English, he appointed a public prosecutor and demanded there be delivered sentencing. On March 7 or 8, all the alleged confederates were brought in the hall of the Dutch castle, besides Ephraim Ramsey, John Powell, John Sadler, and one Thomas Ladbrook, all other men were condemned to death. On the same night of their sentencing, Samuel Coulson and Edward Collins were taken to Emerald Thompson's confinement room, where they were told that the governor was willing to grant mercy to one of the three, granted they draw the lots. 
When they did, the Lord fell in Colin's favor and he was taken to join the survivors as well. Soon afterwards, John Beamount was told that his life had been spared by two Dutchmen who had begged on his behalf. Then next came the pardon of George Sherlock, who had not been present in Ambonia when that New Year's Day meeting took place. At last, William Weber was brought before the prosecutors and he was told that his life could be saved as well if he would bring them that big business letter. But how could William produce a letter which most likely did not even exist? It was perhaps William's good luck that in the absence of a letter that could have legitimately indicated the existence of at least something, Dutch granted him a pardon as well. From the Japanese side, I have learned that two men were pardoned as well, but what were their names, I did not find any. The day of the execution dawned with heavy rain clouds in the sky. Sometime later, a drummer and five companies of men were brought to the castle to escort the condemned men to the gallows. The march to the execution ground commenced. Both Emmanuel Thompson and John Clark had to be carried to the execution ground because of the extreme torture they had been subjugated to. At the gallows, the alleged mastermind of the conspiracy, Gabriel Dawson, was the first man to be executed. After Gabriel's death, Samuel Coulson collected himself. Like others, Coulson had begged Dutch to spare his life. Whether guilty or not, Samuel Coulson went to his death as a brave man. Soon, one after the other, 18 more men lost their lives. One Dutch resident and Ambonia later recalled that the Japanese had actually went singing to their death and according to others, they even had competed to become the first one to die. At the end of the day, the heads of Gabriel Dawson, Haitio, Sidney Majel, and of one other Japanese named Peter Okongi were put on the public display. Around two months after the executions, John Powles, one of the survivors, later reached the English company's headquarters in Batavia. After learning what had transpired in the Ambonia region, the company's first response was to safeguard their asset against the like bloody attempts against us. Then the very next day, the rumors started spreading amongst Dutch that the English were preparing for a bloodbath in Batavia. Likewise, there were floated rumors in the English camp as well that the Kuhn's successor Peter the Carpenter was plotting some great villainy against them. In all these heightened tensions, the survivors of Hermione reached Batavia around May 1623. Upon arrival, John Beamount had to prostrate on the ground and had to confess to the conspiracy yet again, lest Dutch would torture him. The English and the Dutch company's members spent the summers of 1623 aggressively proving, disapproving there had existed a conspiracy or not. Let's reiterate a little bit to try to understand if there was a feasibility in the plot or not. On February 23, Dutch apprehended one of their Japanese guards because he was asking the details of their garrison to green Dutch soldiers. After intense interrogation, he confessed that there existed a plot involving other Japanese soldiers and English merchants to seize the Dutch castle. At the time, there were present around two to 300 Dutch soldiers in Ambonia alone, while the Japanese together with the English did not account for more than 32 men. Even if we were to believe William Griggs' confession, who allegedly said that Towson had at his service not only Japanese but also slaves and some Spanish prisoners, I have read this somewhere that their numbers could not even then have crossed more than 100 men. William Gregg's confession, however, raises an argument. If Tavison was raising a contingent of his own, how could not the whispers of that uprising reach Dutch ears? Was everyone this tightly lived? Let's say, let's just say for the argument's sake that the that everyone was uh, really quiet, okay? But in the age where the number of soldiers literally used to mean the difference between victory and defeat, would hundred men have overcame three hundred soldiers? Uh, with good weapons and a surprise attack, yeah, they might have. But after the arrests of Towson and others, Dutch searched English dwelling in Ambonia. It is said that there they found no more than two muskets, three swords and a half pound of powder, presumably gunpowder. In Gabriel's own confession, he allegedly said that so far was he from promising the men of the neighboring factories any powder, ordnance, bullets or muskets or any ammunition of war. 
What about the English ships? So many had confessed that they were going to launch the attack on the arrival of any English ship. Around the events, there were anchored around 6 to 8 Dutch ships in Ambonia alone. While English did not have any, neither they were expecting any. Even if for some reason there had arrived any English ship in Ambonia, it would have been extremely Extremely shocking for its crew to learn that the English chief factor was about to open a campaign to seize the Dutch castle and all he was waiting for their arrival. Again, even if for argument's sake there had arrived any English ship with enough man and firepower, and if Towson had after many casualties taken the Dutch fort, wouldn't that action have accounted for an invitation to open war? How Towson had defended the castle from subsequent Dutch attacks? By 1620s, the Dutch East India Company was becoming an unstoppable juggernaut in the East Indies. By then, they had around 2,000 Dutch soldiers, 21 fortresses and 100 plus ships all operating in the region, while English on the other hand were already trading along the paths of bankruptcy in the East Indies. The plot was feasible? Ah, uh, I don't believe so. I believe the most significant issue with the Dutch governor Herman von Spult was that he did not know when to seize. Even if English had appointed Heitzio for something, after all he was retained because he had been asking questions specifically to Green Dutch soldiers, or was he even caught for asking any questions? Again, only God has the answers. But if he had been appointed for something, I believe the reason for that had been far more subtler than to take down the whole castle. But Wonspult was so determined in his objectives that he only stopped when Heitzio could bear no longer and affirmed his suspicions. This is I believe is enough for part 1. In the next part, I would try to continue to cover the event when the news of Ambonia would reach Europe in May 1624. I hope to see you in the next video. Bye everyone.